For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence, on infiltration instead of invasion, on subversion instead of elections, on intimidation instead of free choice, on guerrillas by night instead of armies by day. It is a system which has conscripted vast human and material resources into the building of a tightly knit, highly efficient machine that combines military, diplomatic, intelligence, economic, scientific, and political operations. Its preparations are concealed, not published. Its mistakes are buried, not headlined. Its dissenters are silenced, not praised. No expenditure is questioned, no rumor is printed, no secret is revealed. It conducts the Cold War in short. With a wartime discipline, no democracy would ever hope or wish to match. Good evening and welcome to Off Planet Radio Live. It is November the 22nd, 2013. It is 50 years since the day when John F. Kennedy was assassinated in Dallas, Texas. And I wanted to do this without bells and whistles and frills. I played a brief excerpt from Kennedy's speech. This was the speech where he addressed the issues of uh, secret societies. And also at that time, the contest that was going on between the national security state and the press. Uh, the backdrop of the JFK assassination is many fold and many people have studied it for the last 50 years and seen the battle that was taking place both in the foreground and the background of how media was transitioning even as the country itself was grappling with the security state that had been imposed upon it and how the security state had in fact begun to take over the legitimate government. As you're going to hear in the interviews tonight, there are still to this day many questions that have not been answered. There are many details within this, the assassination scenario on November 22, 1963 that have remained unsolved largely because of obfuscation and deliberate manipulation of the evidence by the powers behind the scenes who brought about this tragic event. There's very little doubt anymore that this was a single shooter event or that, in fact, it was not a highly masterminded conspiracy to take out the president who was attempting to honestly grapple with the issues of the day, with integrity and a sense of truth. He wasn't a saint. He was simply a man of his time who stood on the edge of history. And he was probably the last legitimately, well, was he even legitimately elected himself? That's a question that Robert Morningstar is going to go into. He was certainly the last president that we would see able to have a free hand during the life of his administration. And he was the last president who would openly oppose what became the cabal that now rules the United States of America. So we're going to continue over the next probably two and a half hours with interviews. And uh, I have with me on the line tonight a friend, somebody who's been here many times on the show. We've actually done a lot of shows together over the years. And uh, he actually is a figure who stood on the edge of history himself. And I want to welcome Ev Halford. Good evening, Ev. It's good to be here. I hope that, you know, in this short discussion that we have, I'm able to elucidate a little bit about uh, the Kennedy assassination, at least from, you know, my perspective. You and I actually met uh, around um, another radio show years ago, which was called The Grassy Knoll. And uh, so I came to know you kind of with the backdrop of uh, the whole Kennedy assassination and conspiracy theories and all the things that you and I have talked about. You actually were somewhere... 50 years ago that sat on the edge of what happened historically the day that followed. you want to talk a little bit about that tonight, Ev? 
Well, you know, it's not something I often talk about, but you know, I was four years old, actually four, almost five years old, in November of uh, 1963. And uh, my father worked uh, for a sensitive uh, civil service job at the uh, Kelly Air Force Base, one of the military bases in San Antonio. And somehow uh, he got a special place up in the, um, the motorcade you know, the day before, on November the 21st, there, there was a motorcade in San Antonio in much the same way there would be one in Dallas the next day. And I actually, as crazy as it may sound, uh, got a chance at four years old to have a few words with President Kennedy the day before he was shot. The motorcade stopped. My father was holding me up, and Kennedy asked me a few questions. He asked me how old I was, what my name was. And uh, I remember this as one of the first memories I have from that period of time of looking at him and Jacqueline uh, Kennedy in the uh, limousine with our other officials now who I don't recognize. But, you know, I clearly remember seeing both of them and having this short chat with him the day before he died. It's one of those surreal moments, you know, I've often thought about, you know, of all the children and all the places that he could have spoken that uh, you know, day before, why, why me? And um, I guess you know, as we've talked about, and in fact, I think that one of the first programs I did with Physical was talking about my father and this kind of Forrest Gump relationship to uh, certain events of history. And, I, and he, and I think I was just being carried along with that because he seemed to have been on the fringes of so many of these uh, events of the last 50 years, beginning as far back as I can remember with the Kennedy assassination. And that was a transforming event. It was when the uh, cabal, which uh, rules the uh, world at this point, made their final move and demonstrated that they could kill a president in full view of, you know, witnesses, and uh, even as it was being filmed and they could get by with it. And to me, um, it's amazing that they've been getting by with it for so many years, even though, you know, recent polls say that 80% of the Americans believe that there was a conspiracy behind the Kennedy assassination. People still uh, are surprised that the media and the academic community haven't budged an inch on the official story. And this says a lot about, you know, what those in power think about us as human beings because they're so willing to, to even at this point lie when they know that uh, most of us, in fact, the vast majority of us don't believe them anymore. But they're so confident uh, as to their hold on power that, you know, they'll lie openly. And that's just a, you know, small impression of you know, my own personal experience of that day. Most people don't have memories going back as young as four years old, so I know that made an impression. Do you, to this day, have a visual picture of Mr. Kennedy that day? Yeah, I, I remember exactly what he looked like. You, you know, it's funny, my father, you know, told me that uh, at the time, the Kennedy had a lot of makeup on uh, for the cameras. And that uh, it was an eerie thing seeing someone, you know, especially a man with all of this heavy makeup on. And, uh, you know, my father in his kind of dark and caustic and cryptic sense of humor said that he had turned to my mother and mentioned that uh, this is the kind of makeup that, you know, that uh, undertakers will often use, you know, to make someone look a lot better than they in, in death and they probably looked in life. I don't know if there was something prophetic in that, uh, but it did, you know, I do remember that he looked, you know, kind of pasty in the face and uh, almost surreal. I mean, it's like, you know, you're watching uh, something, you know, through a kind of foggy, filtered lens, and that's, that's how my memory is of, that, uh, of those moments. 
Well, we have this image of this young, vibrant president, but in fact, Jack Kennedy was not well. Um, in fact, I believe they did not want an autopsy done on him because they were going to discover that he was suffering from, I believe it was an adrenal disease. Uh, he was taking injections of adrenaline to keep going. He obviously had serious pain from his wartime back injuries. And so, you know, a lot of what they called Camelot at that time was, in fact, partially an illusion. Uh, President Kennedy, in fact, was not in the best of health and was apparently in continual pain as well. Yeah, well, I've heard that the Addison's disease, I think, was a disease. Yes. Was a diagnosis. Look, it's obvious for, uh, from just studying his life that he was someone that was raised in, uh, you know, in kind of elite circles and, and decided at some point to turn on, on the values that he had been raised by Joe Kennedy and the entourage that surrounded his father. And, you know, he was reluctantly pushed into this because, you know, his uh, older brother Joseph was the, the intended to be the president, and Joseph was killed in a plane crash in, during the Second World War. And so uh, his father turned to him to fulfill his dreams about having a son that was president. And I think that uh, John Kennedy kind of reluctantly went into that role. And when he realized, you know, what had happened, especially after the film, the Bay of Pigs uh, invasion, and he realized that who was controlling, you know, the forces of power in the United States, uh, basically the CIA and the intelligence community, what uh, Eisenhower called the military-industrial complex, that those people were the ones that were calling the shots. And he openly uh, was talking about dismantling the CIA and dismantling key components of that whole structure. So, you know, there were a lot of people who were upset with him over the way he was taking the country. And, you know, yeah, I don't know. He had fired the CIA, CIA director, Dulles, and he had also formed the Defense Intelligence Agency, I think as a counterfoil to try and decentralize intelligence power, which in that, that clip that I played uh, going into the show tonight, which was from 1961, he was trying to balance the uber-secrecy that was surrounding the, the government's military operations with freedom of the press, and at the same time not enabling uh, some sort of centralized power to coalesce. So he was really walking a delicate balance throughout his, his uh, well, the, the, the three years that he was president. And uh, he made enemies, as I said, in all areas. He wanted to deplete the. He wanted to remove the old depletion allowance. He wanted to issue uh, interest-free currency. Um, in fact, he printed up silver certificates. Know, silver certificates, yeah. and he uh, and two-dollar bills, among other things. And he uh, was obviously not uh, willing to enter into a full deployment in Vietnam, which, you know, Johnson, immediately after the assassination, reversed all those policies. He was not, you know, at the table with all of those in power, and, and including, you know, those from both sides of the aisle, both Democrats and Republicans, that didn't uh, see him as the kind of leader that they wanted. And I think they wanted to make an example about, you know, the absolute power that they felt that they had to control the events going forward. And they basically had a firm hand over the media, over the political arena ever since. And the fact that 50 years on now, you know, there's been no serious questioning of the official story and the official sources in the public media it has been, you know, they still call those a question, you know, conspiracy theorists with a kind of derisive edge to it. Demonstrates, you know, their confidence that, you know, their absolute control over the minds of, you know, uh, of so many in this country. 
you yourself um, have obviously kind of been interwoven over the years in some of the details of this. And part of the reason why I wanted to have you on tonight, Ev, what, what we talked about was um, some of the encounters that you had um, in your work as you were a priest in the uh, Russian Orthodox Church and you encountered what are called the White Russians and in turn came into some information that plays into this as well. Give us a little bit of the background and details. Well, actually, I wasn't the uh, uh, priest in the Russian Orthodox Church. I was a priest in the Greek Orthodox okay. Church. But I was in the Russian Orthodox Church for a very long time, for like nearly 15 years. Uh, and uh, in Texas, I was part of what they called uh, the Orthodox Church of America, which was from the Moscow uh, Patriarch Supporting uh, Church. And then uh, after we came to New York uh, and after uh, an unfortunate experience in a Russian Orthodox seminary, uh, I ended up uh, with the dissident Russian group called the Russian Church Outside of Russia, and I was with them for seven years from 1990 to 1997 before I entered into the Greek Church, and then I was ordained to the priesthood in the year 2004. So I was seven uh, years with them before I was ordained into the priesthood. So I've been a Greek Orthodox priest for... Since nineteen, since two thousand four, ten years now, almost ten years here yeah, in January. So in the in the nineteen eighties, if I recall correctly, you had uh, some encounters with the, with what a group called White, the White Russians. You want to explain that and how that plays into the backstory of the JFK assassination? Well, anybody who you know. Uh, who's read, you know, or done any research on the Kennedy assassination will come across certain key documents. And, you know, I, uh, long before the Internet, I got it in my hands on a copy of a document called the Torbett document. You know, um, the official title was what they call a nomenclature of an assassination compiled. It was one of the first uh, documents that I read that, question the Kennedy assassination. It was based on the Jim Garrison investigation, allegedly, written by some synonymous uh, attorney named William Torbett. And in that document, it, it talked about some of the key players uh, in the, the underground in, the, in Dallas, Texas. And among them was a young priest an American convert named uh, Dimitri Royster, who was named in that document, who I uh, subsequently found out was um, Marina Oswald's father confessor when she uh, came to Dallas after, you know, Lee Harvey Oswald brought her, uh, you know, back from Russia when he uh, left uh, Russia after defecting, moving there for three, uh, I think it was three years. And Royster, who was uh, in his 60s at the time, uh, in the mid-80s and up to 1990, might, you know, would periodically come down uh, to visit the small Russian church that my wife and I were going to. And uh, he was very fluent in Spanish. In fact, he was a professor of Spanish at SMU, Southern Methodist University in Dallas. And my wife, who is uh, of Mexican-American extraction, uh, used to speak to him in Spanish. And uh, we had a uh, good rapport with him. Of course, at that point, I didn't know how intimately connected he was with the um, Russian community in Dallas. In fact, at the St. Seraphim Cathedral, over which he presided, was the church in which uh, George de Morenschild and all of these other uh, participants and uh, in benefactors of Oswald you know, attended church periodically. And in fact, I, uh, had, you know, it was a good 30 years after the fact, but I was uh, involved with people that were still involved with the de Morenschild family. 
And it was Royster who had to finally give the uh, final um, sign-off for me to go to this Russian seminary up in uh, Crestwood, New York, where I attended for a semester. And, um, of course, that was in 1990, one year prior to the so-called collapse of the Soviet Union. And there were actual Soviet uh, students that were attending that uh, seminary when I was there. And uh, it turns out that uh, Royster, if you read the, the actual testimony of the uh, Warren Commission, uh, that he's mentioned the number of times. I, mean, I, I actually went to the uh, assassination records uh, archive and uh, did a word search for him and read. In fact, I printed out the, the entire transcript of, the, of various testimony concerning his involvement with Marina Oswald, you know, during and post the time of the assassination so uh, now now that I know that you know that all of these people including George de Morenschild had CIA connections you realize that the so-called white Russian community in Dallas was heavily infiltrated by the uh, intelligence agencies and uh, it's no surprise then that my father was highly uh, wary of my involvement with these people and tried uh, Fervently, for the whole uh, several years that we were involved with them in San Antonio, to try to get me to distance myself from them. In fact, one time he made a joke about it. He said that uh, if you're not careful, you may find yourself becoming another patsy for these people, and just as Oswald was. And you know, I think one of the, as I said, I've talked about my father and his kind of uh, life on the fringes of all of these things. I mean, he was at NASA during the Mercury program in 1964, just following the assassination, and then in the Vietnam War period, you know, with the escalation, he was involved with uh, DARPA for a while, you know, the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency. And then um, during the um, 80s, he... uh, was involved, uh, you know, at Lackland Air Force Base with basic training, and and he ended his uh, career basically involved with the um, Defense Mapping Agency, and then with uh, the uh, clinic at Lackland Air Force Base. And the, one of the last conversations I had before coming to New York was about how the Gulf War and the first Gulf War was going to start because he apparently had advance notice just a couple of weeks beforehand and called me up and said, we're going, uh, you know, to a live war in Kuwait. And uh, he always warned me that uh, his life had been on the fringes of all of these events and that I should be careful. So I was given a kind of glimpse into all of this when I was a very young man. Do you have an insight today based on everything that you've studied? And I know you've read extensively over the years, Ev, um, into the JFK assassination. And also, you know, you've done your independent research as well as, you know, your encounters. Do you have any idea to this day who, I, I, somebody asked this in the chat room, and it's a kind of a loaded question because they wanted to know who you believe shot President Kennedy, and yet I don't think we have a single answer for that, do we? No, I think there were several teams there. Uh, there was a redundancy factor that they, they, they never wanted uh, there to be a clear answer. I mean, it's layer upon layer upon layer of... Uh, of, of subterfuge, so you know, um, it wouldn't surprise me that there were four to five to six different teams there. Uh, each one, you know, uh, finally, you know, thinking that they were the ones that were there to do the job, and you know, that's part of the problem. You know, it's like the the age-old question as to who rules the world: is it the Jesuits or uh, the Zionists or the uh, 
Freemasons, you know, uh, and you hear these countless, you know, arguments between various proponents of various sides. And I think that, you know, there's always this kind of a multi-layered plan in order to um, mask the fact of who is in fact behind it. And my my gut feeling is is that for a brief respite, a brief period of time, these normally warring factions decided to come together because they all saw Kennedy as such a threat to their continued hegemony over whatever aspects of the U.S. economy or U.S. life that they that they had dominance, that they were all willing to come together in order to see that he was taken out. People that you wouldn't normally think would cooperate, and uh, that's uh, why I think when you look at the Kennedy assassination, you see it pointing in so many different directions. You know, there was mob inv- involvement and CIA involvement, and po- probably possible uh, foreign intelligence agency involvement, and uh, you know, uh, and. I think it's even very even just given the study. fact even just given the fact that Joseph Kennedy himself you know obviously rolled the 1960 election I mean he pulled in favors from the gangsters in Chicago he he got the uh, primaries tossed in West Virginia so you know your choice of villains here includes what looks like in the end some of the good guys and Robert Morningstar who you're going to hear as our second uh, our third interview tonight he's going to be after Nick Redford Nick Redford is coming up next and uh, Morningstar was a pre-record we did last week he did almost three hours of uh, which we're going to air an hour tonight and we'll post it but Robert Morningstar goes extensively into a whole list of, of, of people as well and um, th- th- when you begin to look at the theater that was mapped out that day in Dallas, it looks like a shooting gallery, and it looks like there were multiple shooters with multiple agendas, multiple weapons involved, and it, it seems like they just lined up every possible angle and, and corralled President Kennedy and, Kennedy and his motorcade into a shooting gallery. Yeah, and I think that there were gunmen, as I said, from uh, every different uh, group that had uh, a hatred for Kennedy in, in Kennedy's plans. Yeah, and don't forget the Cubans. There's uh, Robert Morningstar talks about this as well. Um, the Cuban who uh, is a man. Yeah, the anti-Castro Cubans yeah. uh, who were very upset because of his failure to provide the you know, air cover for the Bay of Pigs invasion. And and you know I, I'm you know I tend to be sympathetic that the actual people on the ground were the uh, people that Mark Lane in his book uh, Plausible Denial claims that there you know that it was David Ferry and the anti Castro Cubans you know that that were major players in this whole thing. Well, and David Ferry has uh, you know there's some interesting details about Ferry as well. I mean, he's he seems to go through this it almost like one of the fibers in a tapestry. And connecting him, once you connect him to Jack Ruby, you connect him back to the CIA operations he was running because he had been fired from Eastern Airlines over a homosexual liaison. Um, It becomes more and more interesting to see that there were central figures in this, chief of which was probably Jack Ruby himself. And uh, the fact that, uh, you know, all of the illegal uh, gun running that was part of uh, the whole Louisiana connection to this, he was involved in that as well. I mean, there there were so many different aspects of, you know, coming together you uh, to deal with a common enemy uh, that I, you know, I'm not surprised, you know, by any of the people, uh, you know, that... Uh, have been linked to this or, you know, fingers have been pointed towards them. My problem is is that people want to have simple answers. They want to have a, you know, 
plot like a Hollywood movie, and I think that there were far more people involved than, than a simple plot in, you know, a monolinear plot in a Hollywood movie. Oh, it's multidimensional. In a lot of ways, there's some so many creepy aspects to it. I, you know, you riff on the, just on the numbers alone. I, I got to thinking about this. You have 11 cars in the motorcade traveling at 11 miles an hour, and it is um, November 22nd, which the digits add up to 33, in Dallas, sitting on the 33rd parallel. The parallel, I know. It's, it's amazing if you think about it. But when we, uh, you know, you, you think about the, the fact that uh, in Freemasonry, these numbers have intense significance, and there's Freemasonry around every aspect of this. And in fact, Dealey Plaza itself was the site of one of the first Freemason temples in Texas. And if you go and you look at the site, even uh, today, you know, I, we managed to see the site back in 1990, 20 years ago. I took a Greyhound bus trip uh, from New York to San Antonio. It was a horrible trip, but uh, the bus stopped in Dallas, and it turns out that the Greyhound bus station was a couple of blocks away from Dealey Plaza. And I took my wife, and we had two children. You know, they were, uh, my son, I think, was almost five, and... We had a, an infant, and we walked around Dealey Plaza and looked at the, you know, at all of the landmarks there. And I looked up at the sixth floor of the school book depository. I, you know, I had just seen the JFK movie a short time before, so you know, I was fully aware. And I had read, you know, all of these Kennedy assassination uh, books at that point: Mark Lane's Plausible Denial and Rush to Judgment and uh, Henry Holt's uh, Reasonable Doubt and uh, on the Trail of the Assassins by uh, Jim Garrison and a whole litany of these uh, books and uh, to actually see that, to actually see how much smaller it is than we imagined. And just, you know, and that's one of the hard things to fathom is, you know, all those gunmen and all of those participants involved in this conspiracy basically standing around everywhere, which is no surprise to me, that, you know, with all the videos that, uh, you know, I've seen, including the Robert Groden's uh, compilation of all of the you know, extant videos that he had, just, you know, he had found, showing everyone running towards the grassy knoll immediately after the shots were fired. And then, when you realize that the, the so-called grassy knoll was, in fact, a fence line that led to a parking lot and a railway yard. Yes. And there was a tower there that Lee Bowers uh, was sitting in, one of the first uh, witnesses to have been killed under strange circumstances, because he had claimed that he saw some men with rifles uh, standing at the fence. And all the witnesses that have been killed, I mean, this is one of the aspects of the... Uh, of all of these uh, false flag operations, it's, uh, you know, those that are, that have information that could potentially open up the uh, truth about the uh, false flag, you know, those witnesses are very quickly eliminated. Well, and, and and now, you know, they've refined it to such a point. Somebody in the chat room mentioned about Sandy Hook. Well, now you have completely prefabricated events with, with actors, crisis actors, and this stuff is just played out as media events. This particular event in Dallas was actually the perfect storm in so many ways because it not only launched what a, a whole change in the government. I mean, we, we saw at least three American presidents involved, if you consider the fact that George Herbert Walker Bush was also seen on the ground in Dallas that day. You have Gerald Ford, who would wind up on the Warren Commission, and you have Lyndon Baines Johnson. But you also had the media profile. Oh, Richard Nixon as well, by the Richard way. Richard Nixon as well, yeah. Yeah, he doesn't remember where he was that day, though. No. 
but you have the next generation of politicians. It was a great film, though, that I saw by John Hankey. I, I don't know if you're familiar with him, about the JFK assassination. It's one of the uh, best films that I've seen. I've not seen that, no. So uh, by my recommendation is that uh, to uh, do a Google search of the name John Hankey, H-A-N-K-E-Y, and you'll come across his film that he did, and it's it basically goes over the anti-Castro-Cuban connection, and I thought it was fascinating. And you know, and if you've read anything about you know Mark Lane's work, yes. then you you'll be familiar with the, the story he tells in this film. And of course, he shows uh, the skull and bones connection to all of it, and how all of these Sal and Dulleson. A lot of the key players uh, involved, you know, were from Yale and had been part of the Skull and Bones Society. Now, that's, fact, uh, that's a connection that is beyond interesting, um, the whole Skull and Bones connection. that That's one that I had not really thought about. And, you know, there was a movie that uh, I think... Uh, Matt Damon made called uh, I'm trying to remember the name uh, where he uh, was it was a kind of pseudo retelling of the life of, of James Jesus Angleton and uh, he talked a lot about uh, the secret rituals of the skull and bones and the uh, the whole underpinning in, in this uh, society of these uh, secret organizations. And, you know, I've had a tremendous fascination with the with, with these kind of secret societies, and, uh, you know, which is interesting because it goes back to what uh, John Kennedy said in the speech about how uh, Americans have never really been uh, open to the idea of secret societies running everything. But that's precisely what we have now is, you know, these people with the secret handshakes, you know, uh, and the secret rituals, uh, often occult rituals. And they're the ones that are basically running, still running the show now. And since the coup of uh, 1963 where they took out a president, uh, they make no qualms about the fact that, you know, that they rule this country with an iron hand. I mean, my son was commenting about the police state nature, you know, how much more open now they are, where they used to mask the factor, would make a pretense about, you know, freedom and, you know, would train people, you know, to believe that, you know, we were basically an egalitarian democracy here. But now, you know, they don't make any pretense about who's in charge and that we're basically uh, inmates in a prison system. You know, we're wage slaves for most of them. And uh, I don't think that would have been possible without the first being uh, able to take out a president and then basically subvert the media and prevent the truth uh, about that event from ever coming out. They're pretty confident now that they can stage uh, false flag operations and they keep everyone in line. I think that's, the, if anything, that's one of the greatest legacies of, of the social control that they gained by successfully taking out a president. Yeah, the Kennedy assassination was very much about securing the, uh, the elite's place in the forming world. If you stop to think about it, JFK was really the first post-war, World War II president. We had, obviously, Truman, who hung over from the uh, war period, and then um, uh, Eisenhower, who was basically re elected on the strength of you know, his, his, his military prowess during the war. So Kennedy represented kind of a, a shift and a real possible changeover because we had the security state that was brought in, and this is one of the linchpins to all of this, was... They never explained to us exactly what the National Security Act was. Most people have never read it, and most people don't really understand that not only was there a National Security Act and a National Security Agency, but in fact, 
in order to implement post-war security, they actually jettisoned the original constitutional government and stepped up what Eisenhower then called the military-industrial complex, which was basically the the cabal of the corporate business interests and military and the military and intelligence agencies themselves. And that's who's ruling this country now. That's who uh, calls the shots on, you know, on the, the kind of government, the kind of safety net that we have. They're the ones that uh, fund the elections for congressmen, and they're the ones that uh, determine what policies are implemented by you know, our so-called representatives in Congress, and they're the ones that influence the judges in the courts. I mean, uh, there hasn't been a legitimate, serious investigation of anything in the last 50 years. Everything has been a cover-up. Well, it's basically uh, <laughs> allowing the criminals to investigate themselves. When you look, just look at the Warren Commission and how that was stacked out, I mean, these were bought men. Yeah, but, you know, there shouldn't be commissions. I mean, I want to, you know, why, do, you know, these commissions are always there to rubber stamp an official story. I mean, we have a court system, and, you know, a court system requires an adversarial position, requires discovery, the uh, subpoena of witnesses, the compulsion of testimony. Well, this is what you, you... But this, this, is how you, this is how you operate in the absence of evidence, because the evidence would be completely damning to the establishment's <laughs> position. So you jettison the witnesses, you jettison the perps, you, you, you get rid of... Or, or you alter the evidence, just as, I mean, right down to even the Kennedy autopsy. And then you have a rubber stamp commission who takes what remains of so-called evidence and, and puts together the most ludicrous stories in the world. I mean, the single bullet theory that Arlen Specter propounded, that bought Arlen Specter 40 years of power in government, just as it bought Gerald Ford the presidency and all the other people in that commission who did not stand up. And, uh, yeah, and the one attempt, the House Assassination uh, Committee uh, during the 70s, that, you know, you know, after the uh, replacement of the uh, CIA director, you know, that was shut down. They will not allow a serious investigation or discovery or witnesses or the gathering of evidence for anything. And, you know, just in my own personal experience, in my own little copyright case, they won't even allow discovery. They, they, they've not allowed any discovery at all or any suit to go uh, to a discovery stage for the for 9-11. Well, you do remember that post-Kennedy, 1964, they completely recontoured the entire justice system, uh, beginning with the federal courts and moving it right down to the local level. They basically reconfigured the courts to be, um, I guess you would call them courts of equity under UCC. We began, I know. You know, we began to see our court that. system changed as well. No, well, everything changed. And, you know, the, and the consolidation of the media, the uh, allowing mass conglomerates, you know, to uh, own everything. You know, buying up all of the family-owned publishing houses and creating these huge three-company conglomerates that own all the publishing and didn't control what books are published or what movies are made. I mean, there were always uh, monopolies in Hollywood. But now it's all part of the same military industrial complex and intelligence complex. I mean, uh, you know, I remember early on when the Internet was created and back in the mid-90s, and I used to go to the public library because we didn't have a computer. And I, and I would read about, you know, things like Operation Mockingbird, about the, you know, the CIA involvement in, uh, in the publishing industry and the, in the media. But the fact that, you know, the uh, Reese Commission, the taxes and foundations during the yeah. 1950s that received all the funding and how they basically controlled academia in this country. And the creation of the Department of Education, you know, you know these kind of uh, pet 
peeves of you know uh, 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 of those on the right, the so-called conservatives. You know, I think uh, you know I've never believed in you know this false left-right paradigm. You know, it's one of the things my father told me uh, many, many times growing up that they're all working for the same team. It's theater. It's like you know Punch and Judy. You well, know, it's dichotomy. I mean, and if you look at it from the strictest sense. John Kennedy probably was, in the old sense, the last true conservative president we had. He was a fiscal conservative. Yeah. He was he was conservative in the sense, and this was the speech that I played from 1961 at the beginning. He was straddling the lines between control and freedom, understanding that the world we lived in re did require a certain amount of security, but it didn't require a security state. And he still believed in the freedom of the press at that time. And, you know... Well, he said in that speech that it was the press, a free press that was the protector of these things. And we haven't had a free press in such a long time. I mean, I, you, know, and I, you know, and I don't want to harp on my own personal, you know, experiences concerning, you know, my own involvement with the courts, but... We do not have a free press in any sense of the word in, uh, in this country. If you have a contrary opinion to the official line, you're not going to be allowed to, to, for your voice to be in any kind of public forum. It's just the way it is. I mean, you know, there's a large alternative media in the internet and other places, but. Well, it's, the mainstream <laughs> is, you know, you're not going to be invited. Unfortunately, the alternative media is fractured and fragmented so badly by individual individual interests and egos and control structures. The internet free press will be gone in five years, I think. Whatever no, uh, Google there is. is basically uh, corralled any real effective free speech. Saying we were talking about. The fact that the way that these search engines work now, it used to be that, you know... Oh, I know. They gamed it, it completely. Would... Yeah. We used to be getting uh, two to 5,000 hits, hits a week on our website, and after Google reconfigured their search engines last year, we saw the numbers drop to like 10%. Well, you know, just an interesting thing, and this is a sidebar, is that I was looking up to see some of the old interviews that we had done, and I typed my name, Ev, uh, the program's Ev Halford, and what came up on a Google search was bore absolutely no resemblance to anything that, you know, and you couldn't find the programs. You'd have to go five, six, seven, eight pages deep mm -hmm, mm -hmm. before you would even come across one of the programs. We got deep sexed, basically. And that's what's happening. And... <laughs> and and the, you know, the, the phone software, uh, you know, which I don't think can be an accident that the phone software, uh, you know, unless you're paying attention, will, uh, will you know, corrects, uh, like, uh, my name uh, with Wilford or something that, you know, that bears no real resemblance to the name. I think it, it, at some level, they, they don't want us to find the information. And that's, uh, and that's what Google's purpose ultimately was for. It wasn't to be a search engine. It was to be a, a, a methodology to prevent certain information from being readily available on the Internet. Yeah. So, you know, here we are 50 years later, and we're fighting the same battles all over again, and we're watching the same forces suck the life out of anybody that dares to stand up and challenge the status quo. And we're coming up on the top of the hour, and we have Nick Redfern in the queue. Um, let people know a little bit about your book, The uh, the Omega Conspiracy, which they can find on Amazon. Yeah, I you know I have two books. You know, the first was Vision. It's called Visionary. It was published in two thousand and eight. In fact, I think uh, one of the uh, the second interview that I did with you back in uh, January of two thousand and nine was about that book. 
first was actually about Russia. You know, that's how you and I came to be. Is that you heard a an interview that I did with Visigoth on the Grassino program about about Russia, and mm-hmm. you asked me to go on your program on the threshing floor. Yes. Uh, I wrote a, a, a book back in 2001, just before 9/11, called The Omega Conspiracy. And after 9/11 happened, I kind of set on that book because it was basically a novelization and uh, almost a satire, but you know, told kind of tongue in cheek, but very real about how the NSA worked how uh, the FBI and the CIA worked, uh, and, you know, and, and how false flags work. And how stage terror uh, basically works with and the, to manipulate people in order to believe certain things about the world. And that was the book that I wrote. And, you know, now things have come full circle, and I finally decided that I was going to actually release that book, and it's, I put, it's been put up on uh, Kindle now for Amazon, and you know, depending if I can get sales on that, then I'm going to finance you know, uh, putting out a print copy. I, I don't think I'm going to find a, one of the mainstream publishers that are willing to publish a, no. a book that actually... <laughs> Uh, deals with the uh, the way the NSA works and the surveillance grid. I mean, there's a whole story in the in the book about um, a anti uh, terror organization called Omega, created by this uh, my magic boy hero from the uh, screenplay that I wrote back about the same time and how he's creating an army uh, to fight these secret societies, and he's building his own uh, highly technical army to deal with them. And uh, they decide that they're going to masquerade at least a part of their group as a video club and deliver their messages in descriptions for movies. So... uh, this FBI guy, who's one of the major characters, gets a you know a hold of this disc, and he calls in a one of the top cryptologists from the FBI to decipher this disc, and uh, he's not able to do it. There's a hacker in uh, in the uh, book called um, Agamemnon who uh, is able to finally crack the disc open, and in it are you know, a treasure tour of 208 documents uh, describing how this particular secret society plans to uh, extend its hegemony to rule the world. This was a way, a commentary at the time about what I saw, is how this group that currently controls the world actually operates. And in that book, I made uh, numerous references to the JFK assassination. You know, hints for those who've read that are familiar with the JFK conspiracy, that they can understand, you know, yeah. um, how all of this, you know, even though it's couched as a story, is very much a commentary uh, as to how the world really works. And uh, it's told in a kind of, you know, my son was joking, I know that the major uh, impetus of this is about a strawberry festival in a small uh, town in Virginia. <laughs> Kind of, kind of tongue in cheek in a way, but how they try to create for us and for you know uh, a a kind of matrix like world of comfort and you know uh, and Twitter while they're doing their nefarious deeds you know in the dark, and now they're becoming even bolder and they're actually stepping into the light and uh, doing their nefarious deeds now out in front of everyone. Yeah, absolutely. Hey, Ev, it's been great talking to you. We're gonna we're gonna jump out here, and now uh, we have Nick Redford queued up. Uh, the book again is called The Omega Conspiracy. It's on Amazon. I put a link in the chat room. We'll put a link up with the show. And we th- want to thank our first hour guest for tonight, Ev Halford, also known as Michael Halford. And uh, thanks for coming on, my friend. Thank you.
Good to be here. Thanks a lot.